Greetings and welcome to the Nobody Knows My Name panel series presented by Urban Impact and made possible through funding by the Alabama Humanities Foundation. Uh, tonight we are broadcasting live from the historic and iconic 16th Street Baptist Church. We have a fantastic panel uh, lined up where we will discuss the contributions made by African Americans in architecture, design, and construction. Uh, this series is made possible again by funding from the Alabama Humanities Foundation and the primary reason uh, for this series is to inform and educate the country about the contributions of African Americans in the historic Civil Rights and Fourth Avenue Business District. So the moderator for today's panel will be uh, none other than Ivan Holloway. Ivan Holloway serves as Executive Director for Urban Impact. Uh, he is a deacon here at 16th Street Baptist Church and if you have a conversation with Ivan Holloway within one minute, you'll realize that he is a member of uh, Omega Psi Phi fraternity, a uh, graduate of A.H. Parker High School. So without further ado, Mr. Ivan Holloway. Thank you so much, Daryl. Welcome to this wonderful, wonderful evening of conversation with probably four of the most stellar uh, individuals in the field of architecture. Um, I have the pleasure of knowing them personally and working with them in some capacity, capacity professionally. So this is a real exciting evening for me, uh, and I hope that uh, you will take from this experience an opportunity to learn more about the historic Fourth Avenue Business District as we learned in one of our other panels, uh, the Black Business District of Birmingham, we will learn a little bit more about uh, particular architects, designers, and contractors who were influential in building early Birmingham, but the four people that we have here today are people who are building Birmingham right now. So we are extremely excited, and we hope that you will take away from this opportunity to learn more about Birmingham, to learn more about architecture and design, to learn more about these four individuals, get excited about the Fourth Avenue and Civil Rights District, and participate. So without further ado, I want to welcome you and welcome our first guest. Our first presenter tonight is none other than Mr. Victor Blackledge, Jr. Uh, he's a dynamic guy. He's a fantastic guy to know. And I will tell you that his work speaks for itself. So, Victor, if you would tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Victor Blackledge Jr. I am presently retired from the city of Birmingham. I'm retired as executive director of Black Business Building Units. Primary responsibility was all things. Architect by registration and education, I'm a historian by passion. And it was my job to be city liaison for projects that affected those areas. Thank you so much, Victor. Our second speaker tonight is Miss Renee Kilp Rotan. And I will tell you, this is probably one of the most exciting people that you'll ever get a chance to meet and work with when it comes to design and understanding the importance of community engagement. So, Ms. Rotan. I am um, a resident of the city of Birmingham. I was born, however, in Washington, D.C. I have degrees in architecture from Syracuse University. I went to the Architectural Association in London for two years and came back and finished my B. Arch cum laude from Syracuse. And then I went on to Columbia University where I got a Master's of Science in Urban and Regional Planning. I have spent most of my career in a non-traditional path. I am an urban designer and also a master planner. I have served 10 mayors throughout this country on the public architecture side. 
And presently, I am running Studio Rotan as CEO. I've been in the city of Birmingham for 15 years, 13 of which I served as head of capital projects for the city of Birmingham, as well as director of grants and special projects. I'm also director and founder of the Birmingham Civil Rights Heritage Trail. And I was director of master planning for the railroad park. Thank you so much, Renee, for that introduction. Our third guest is none other than Ms. Nalanda Hatcher. Um, since I make comments about everybody else, I've got to make comments about Nalanda. Uh, Nalanda is a person that I've had the pleasure of knowing for quite some time now. And um, she is the type of person that can move mountains. Uh, when mountains think that they can't be moved, uh, I've seen her move them. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Ms. Nolanda Hatcher. Uh, thank you, Ivan, for those very kind words. <laughs> My name is Nolanda Hatcher. I grew up here in Birmingham, uh, mostly the West End and um, until I was 12, and then uh, moved to Fairfield, and I graduated from Fairfield High School. Um, currently, I live and work um, in the 4th Avenue Business District, so I've have a passion for just downtown Birmingham in general. I remember as a child coming downtown with my grandmother, who we rode the bus, <laughs> and just being excited about Christmas downtown and just being downtown. Um, as a child, um, in 1974, my dad had a florist uh, downtown on the corner it, it wasn't on the corner, but in the block where the old Wynn radio station used to be. Uh, and it was Hatcher's Floors, and it, it found its way um, uh, on 2nd Avenue North. Um, and that's where the floors was until he passed in 2004. So have a passion for downtown. And um, my dad and my mom were the, really the inspiration for me to be an architect. I've known that I wanted to be an architect since I was probably um, in the second grade. I remember looking at a set of plans with my dad uh, of his dream house. And I just remember how excited he was when he was telling me about this house that he was going to build. And when I found out that architects made plans, then I wanted to be an architect. Um, I have an older brother, brother whose name is Cass Hatcher, who graduated from Tuskegee University. So I got to, he's about eight years older than I am, so I got to experience his stories about architecture. And uh, although he told me how challenging <laughs> the, the degree was to, uh, to be a, as an architectural student, he did not scare me away. So when I graduated from um, high school, Fairfield High School, I went on to the University of uh, Notre Dame um, and um, uh, completed their five-year program. Uh, one thing that it inspired me to go to Notre Dame was the opportunity your third year to spend that year in Rome. So after um, graduating from Notre Dame, I decided to come back to Birmingham instead of uh, living in Chicago, the city that I absolutely love. <laughs> and I said, if I can get a job in Birmingham as an architect, that's where I'll be. If I don't find a job in six months, I'll be back in Chicago. <laughs> so I was lucky enough to get a job here. And my career has taken somewhat of an unusual path because after uh, working here for, for about three or four years, I decided to go on to law school because I knew that I wanted to, first of all, own my own business, and secondly, to actually be a developer architect. So I have uh, made that my passion in life. Currently, I um, am a partner in Studio 2H Design, LLC, along with my business partner, Craig Hoskins. Our motto is to provide the client and the community with design excellence beyond expectation. And we try to live that mission on an everyday basis. Thank you so much, Nalanda. Our fourth panelist is none other than Mr. Charles Williams, Jr. Uh, Charles uh, comes from a family of architects, and 
it gives me uh, no greater pleasure than to have someone as young and as um, savvy as he is in the marketplace to work with organizations and individuals who are looking to uh, design and design opportunities. So without further ado, Mr. Charles Williams, Jr. Hey, uh, good evening. My name is Charles Williams, uh, uh, Jr., the second. I've been called a lot of things. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and I am a, a practicing architect uh, here in the city. Uh, as Mr. Holloway said, my, my dad is, a, is an architect, so uh, I, I pretty much saw architecture my, my whole life, um, or, or what one did. Um, and so it was, you know, all right, let's, let's, let's go and do this as well. So um, pretty much following in, in footsteps, I guess, to a certain degree. Uh, we work together. We, uh, uh, our firm is here in Birmingham, um, and uh, you know I, I am blown away by by the accomplishments of this of this panel, uh, uh, myself not included. But I, you know, I appreciate being uh, up here with with these guys, and I look to learn from this this whole experience. Thank you so much, Charles. So you've had an opportunity to hear a little bit about our panelists and the experience and knowledge that they bring to this conversation. This evening we want to talk a little bit about uh, the history of the 4th Avenue Business District in Birmingham, uh, founded uh, not so many years after the founding of the city of Birmingham. Uh, the city of Birmingham was founded in 1871, uh, and the church that we're in now, the 16th Street Baptist Church, was founded in 1873. So there was a robust African American community in Birmingham from its early, early, early days. The district in which we will be discussing tonight uh, is formerly known as the Black Business District. And that Black Business District uh, was not the initial home to African American businesses because at that, the forming of the city of Birmingham, black businesses could locate uh, in just about any portion of the city of Birmingham. But as Jim Crow began to take hold of this city, uh, black businesses were pushed into uh, one particular area of downtown Birmingham. And that's the area that we will talk about tonight to where we find that Birmingham had a number of firsts. Birmingham had a rich culture and uh, a very rich history uh, for African-American business, entertainment, the whole nine yards. So tonight we're going to focus on the architects, the designers, and uh, contractors that really form the basis for the, um, the historic preservation of this particular district. So the first person that we're going to talk about is Mr. Robert Robertson Taylor. Uh, Mr. Taylor was born June 8th in 1868 in Wilmington, North Carolina. Mr. Taylor came from a relatively privileged family background. He was able to attend uh, college, and uh, the one thing that was unique about uh, Mr. Taylor was that uh, his parents were of mixed race. And um, Mr. Taylor had an opportunity to work for his father, who was a carpenter. And as a carpenter, he had an opportunity to learn a little bit about design and a little bit about the uh, notion of being in business. Mr. Henry Taylor, who was his father, developed a prosperous career as a contractor, as a builder, and he was able to really send his son off to uh, a prestigious school. While in elementary school, Mr. Taylor was educated at Wilson School and the Gregory Institute, both in Wilmington. He finished the head of his class. After he finished school, he went on to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1888. He was graduated in 1892 with a BS degree in architecture and was the first to do so from MIT. 
Mr. Taylor left MIT and was recruited by Booker T. Washington to be head of the architecture design department at Tuskegee Un University, Tuskegee Institute at that particular time. <coughs> he actually did two stints at Tuskegee. Uh, one in 1899, uh, after he left a large, plant, uh, large architectural firm in Cleveland, Ohio. But his second stint was between 18, 1913 and 1932. Much of his work was in Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, Birmingham and uh, Georgia, although he had uh, works all over the, the country. Uh, his uh, biggest contribution here in Birmingham was twofold. The first one being the design of the Masonic Temple, known as the Colored Masonic Temple, constructed in 1922, and the other being the probably on record being the first partnership of a architectural firm of Taylor and Presley. The second person that we'll talk about today is Mr. Wallace Rayfield. Mr. Wallace A. Rayfield was a pioneer in the architecture field. He was born in Macon, Georgia and educated at the uh, Pratt Institute. Uh, he also attended Howard University, and he received his architectural design degree from the Columbia University. Once he graduated from Columbia, Booker T. Washington also recruited him to Tuskegee Institute as the director of architectural and mechanical drawing. Rayfield worked there until 1908. He opened his first private office in Tuskegee in 1907 and later moved that practice to Birmingham, Alabama. He designed over 140 buildings that we know of uh, throughout the country and um, the um, uh, other countries. Rayfield is particularly known for his work right here at 16th Street Baptist Church, but there are other churches in the Birmingham community where uh, you may have heard of. He also built the 30s, designed the 32nd Street Baptist Church, the Harmony Street Baptist Church, along with the South Illiton Baptist Church. He also did the Mount Pilgrim African Baptist Church in Milton, Santa Rosa County, Florida. Uh, Wallace A. Rayfield was probably one of the prolific architects of that particular time, uh, doing projects at Alabama A&M, at Selma University. Uh, he even designed, uh, in some cases, in Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Mississippi, North Carolina, Ohio, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and West Virginia. Remember, this is the 1800s, and here's an architect all over the country doing great things. The third one we'll talk about is uh, Louis Presley. Persley, I'm sorry, who was born in Macon, Georgia as well in 1890. One of the things about Mr. Persley is uh, most people don't understand that he was also an accredited architect uh, who attended, um, who worked at Tuskegee University but he graduated from Carnegie Institute and he taught mechanical drawing. There's not a lot of history about him, but he was a partner with Mr. Robert Robinson Taylor. And if you've ever had an opportunity to visit the colored Masonic Temple, you'll see the cornerstone with Taylor and Presley architects. Mr. Presley uh, did a number of works in Alabama at Tuskegee University, and uh, he also worked across the country, but his biggest claim to fame is the Colored Masonic Temple right here in Birmingham. 
And the last person that we'll talk about is uh, T.C. Wyndham and T.C. Wyndham Brothers. The Wyndham Brothers Construction Company was organized in 1895 by Thomas C. Wyndham. In 1887, the Thomas bro uh, Thomas's brother, Benjamin, graduated from Leland University in New Orleans and moved back to Birmingham to work with his brother, uh, thus making the partnership of the T.C. Wyndham Brothers Construction Company. I will tell you that this particular uh, construction company was notorious for uh, building all kinds of buildings from houses to businesses to churches and uh, it seemed as if during that time they had an ongoing relationship with uh, Wallace A. Rayfield, design and construction. Uh, but they worked in tandem on a number of projects. Again, one of the biggest projects that the uh, Wonder Brothers constructed was uh, the uh, Colored Masonic Temple uh, in the Fourth Avenue Business District and, of course, 16th Street Baptist Church, just to name a few. But let me tell you how excited I was uh, about this particular company. Uh, this particular company had their headquarters on the corner of 8th Avenue North and 6th Street in uh, the neighborhood right down the street from Parker, Smithfield, and that was their national headquarters because they had branches in cities and states across the country. Uh, they had branches of their office in Indianapolis, in Chicago, in Detroit, in Nashville, and again, their headquarters was right here in Birmingham. I want to read you something about uh, the Wyndham Brothers that came out of a newspaper in Montgomery, Alabama in 1918. It says, uh, Negro Baptist to erect a $10,000 church. Another Negro church costing much more than the average house of worship erected by Negro congregations is to be built at 623 South Union Street. A permit for the erection of the building by the Beulah Baptist Church was obtained from the city engineer Thursday. The church is to cost $10,000 and will be built of brick. It is being erected by the Wyndham Brothers Construction Company. So I just wanted to leave you with uh, those facts about uh, designers, architects, and contractors because a lot of people don't understand that we have a rich and marvelous history when it comes to development. What I didn't talk about was Mr. Wyndham not only built for African Americans, he built in the white community as well. And so I want to start our conversation off talking a little bit about uh, the power of place, meaning that we are in the Civil Rights District, uh, the Black Business District, now known as the Fourth Avenue District. Uh, what was the sense of, of place at that particular time? I'm going to ask that question to uh, Mr. Blackledge. Uh, tell us a little bit about um, the, the, the context by which those designers and contractors were working during that period. Well, at that time, initially on coming to the city, given the period of time that they, they wanted to practice their trade, there were no codified restrictions. They were all socially related. Uh, as, you will, as my counterparts here can, can attest to you, we cannot, as architects, bid on our work. The only way we get a job is somebody want to give us a job, a commission, as it were. And at the time that these gentlemen came to the city, their first objective 
was marketing. You get to, you identify your clients, you get to know your clients, and you make them comfortable. And I'm taking for granted that getting to know your clients is having an idea that your client is going to need your services. And at the time, have them comfortable enough with you to offer you that contract for building. Now, there, there was a point on the Wyndham Brothers and Mr. Rayfield, they were one of the few collaborations that could also provide the mortgage. They would lend you the money. The larger white institutions in the city would, were reluctant, if at all, to lend monies to the extent that we needed monies to build. So they organized and established their own mortgage company to provide the financing for the project that they wanted to build. Um, in these days, we tend to look at that as being, at best, historic, at worst, as being people exercising extra, with extraordinary gift. These gentlemen were not extraordinarily gifted. They were extremely intelligent and direct as to what they wanted to do, and they knew how to do it and get it done well. The projects that they built were not products of a lesser quality or scope. If they could build anything anybody else could build, given the opportunity. What brought them to, what brought us to the Fourth Avenue Historic District, to my mind, was because once they started putting their work out there and the quality of their work was known, they became competitive very competitive here in the city. And that was just about the time of the reconstruction. A disastrous offsuit of reconstruction was Jim Crow, Jim Crowism. Prior to then, if you had the skills and you had the client, you were clear to develop, to build. What was then put in place was the requirements for registration and licensing. Registration and licensing were often given at the whelm of the persons issuing the license. It was in, I think, we had noticed and noted several times prior to when these very well educated gentlemen in architecture were licensed. That was notable only because the ones that were not licensed were not considered worthy, if you will, they were not able to go to the projects that, were, that they were capable of building. The restrictions that came along with Jim Crowism was zoning. We often refer to that as, as redlining. There were only certain place, places that we were able to operate to develop businesses and operate them there. Fourth Avenue was only the center of the black business district, but they were not allowed anymore to build anywhere they wanted to build, to operate businesses anywhere they wanted to operate them. Thus came the beginning of the Fourth Avenue business or black business district, as the words. It began 
the heart of it was obviously Fourth Avenue, and it went Sixth Avenue, Fifth Avenue, Fourth Avenue, Third Avenue, and some portions of Second. From 14th Street, 15th, 16th, 17th Street, 18th, and stopping at 19th Street. Beyond that, there were no black businesses permitted or licensed to build. What we're seeing now and what we're celebrating now is largely survival. Although we were strict in the way we wanted to operate, the client base and clientele here in Birmingham was large enough and strong enough to survive on our own. And that's, in fact, what we did. That went on very strongly <laughs> until desegregation. Uh, desegregation unleashed the monster. So yeah. Victor, you have uh, set the tone for us by uh, helping us understand, again, the power of place. Uh, Nalanda, in terms of, um, you talked a little bit about um, your father and being a uh, business owner in this particular area. I, I want to go back, though, to the uh, the introduction about the architects and uh, T.C. Wyndham and their work. So based on uh, your understanding of, of, of the legacy uh, uh, that they have laid, wh what do you think that, you know, the uh, importance of their early work in uh, design and construction uh, right here in Birmingham, Alabama? Um, and I, I will say I didn't, I didn't come to know about their work until uh, after college and moving back here, but it just confirmed in those early years for me as a uh, young intern architect um, that it could be done. You know, there were successful businesses, and I did learn about them very early in coming back to Birmingham because there used to be tours of uh, the historic buildings uh, downtown uh, Birmingham and the Fourth Avenue Business District was one of those tours at that time. So it was confirmation for me if, if they could do it under the uh, restrictions, the s social restrictions that they had at that time, then I should be able to do just about anything that I want to do. <laughs> so um, they were very much an inspiration. And um, you know, uh, around that time, I looked at guys like Victor, who I would consider a mentor, who who were also proven um, that you know you can uh, proven success in this industry. So um, you know there are not that many uh, black architects in, in in the I'm going to say in the country. Um, just to give you um, an idea of the demographics, just here in in, in Alabama, um, in November of 2019. There were 2,122 registered architects in the state of Alabama. That's a very small number in terms of a professional organization. Now, I said registered architects, so that means that people who have applied, who really reside out of state, they are also a part of that number. So when you look at the resident architects in the state of Alabama, there are only 1,561. You drill down even further, and of those, those demographics are the males are 1,378, and the females are 183. You drill down even further <laughs> to minority architects just in the city of Birmingham, you have males, 29, and then they have a, have a category of other, which could be any other nationality, nine. And for females, they're in, the, in the state there's uh, seven. 
um, and two in a category of other. That's nine in the state of Alabama. And then in Birmingham, there are three black female architects. And I, I, will, I, know, I know one of them. I know two of them. <laughs> I, I don't think I know the third one. I need to meet her. <laughs> and then um, in Birmingham, I, I misspoke in the state of Alabama, there are 39 black male architects and there are only 13 uh, black architects in Birmingham and I'm sitting next to one and two of them. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very small number um, because uh, architecture is not an easy profession and then it takes some introduction to it as a young person to be interested in it. Wow, that's a that was exactly what I was looking for. So, um, Renee, I want to talk to you a minute. So, um, as a uh, person uh, who uh, understands uh, design and definitely uh, the power of place, um, I, you know, I, I, I want to drill down a little bit further with um, the uh, lasting effect uh, that uh, architecture has on our culture as we look back, but then we look forward. So uh, based on uh, the gentleman that we talked about, uh, Wallace A. Rayfield and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Taylor, what are the lasting impressions that they made and the lasting impressions uh, that the work that you guys do right now? Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I think that in order for the audience to truly appreciate uh, what it is that we're talking about here, we'd have to go back to the realm of education, architectural education. Uh, as Nolanda said, uh, architectural education is not for wussies. Uh, it's a five-year program. It's a very arduous program. 50% uh, of your time is spent dealing with design and construction issues. And the other 50% of your time is spent in um, engineering and also uh, structures, understanding how buildings stand up. So architecture is not just about the pretty picture. It's about the pretty picture that stands up, that can be financed, where the architect, once they become licensed, can garner clients. It is a business. I think that part of the training of architecture really sets young people up to understand or at least hope that one day they too will become heroes of the built environment industry. Unfortunately, it's much tougher than that. Um, I think that when it comes to what these particular guys left behind, just to see multi-story buildings that have lasted for 50 to 100 years. Just to know that the men that we're talking about were well-educated at a time in which black folks were not even allowed to read. We have uh, the example of um, Wallace Rayfield. We have the example of um, Robert Taylor who went to very prestigious schools at a time when no one thought much of what it was that we could accomplish having come out of enslavement. Uh, it's no small charge to be the first to graduate uh, from MIT, for example, in the 1890s. Um, I get almost choked up thinking about it only because I happen to be the first black woman to have finished Syracuse University uh, in architecture at a time where it was said that it could not uh, be done. I'm sitting here next to my sister, uh, Nolanda Bearden, who has just done phenomenal things against all odds. So it's not just our celebrating them as men in the field, but then we have gender issues as well when Nolanda read off the number of statistical women who are licensed in this country, 
I think that as a member of the National Organization of Minority Architects, they just published a number this past week that now in the United States of America, we now have 500 black women who are licensed. That's nationwide. So if you do the math, that's like 10 women per state. And I'm not saying that's their geographical distribution. Uh, I remember when I was on faculty at Howard University, we did the first uh, national conference on black women in architecture, and that was in 83, 1983. At that time, there were only 50 black women who were licensed. And I remember it because I said, oh my God, that means mathematically there's one black woman per state, though that wasn't their geographical distribution. So when we're talking about Rayfield and when we're talking about Taylor, uh, just for starters, uh, my God, you can't even talk about these guys without talking about the brilliance of Booker T. Washington having a university for them to build. I mean, you have got to have a client. And that's one of the things that is not stressed in architecture school. You go through the five years and you think you're going to be on the cover of Forbes magazine, all right? But the fact of the matter is, no, like, no tiki, no washi. If you have no client, guess what? You have no business. Now, for myself, I've spent most of um, my career on the public side of architecture. So my client has always been the city. Uh, more politically speaking, my client has always been the mayor you know, that I have served. That is a much more stabilized environment for doing business than when you are in private practice and you've got to get your hustle on. So for these men in the end of the 19th century to have had the wherewithal to go to predominantly white institutions where I'm sure they were not sitting at the head of their class because the classrooms themselves were segregated even though they were at the head of their classes academically. You take someone like a Max Bond, who was my teacher at Columbia, and Max, of course, as we know, was responsible for building the Civil Rights Institute. He built the ML King Center in Atlanta, and he also led the team that just built the new Black Museum on the Mall in DC that has the very long name that I can never remember the whole name of. Uh, but he joined Venture, Max did, with uh, Sir David Ajay and also Phil Freelon. And so we're talking about the decades that it takes to create these kinds of legacies. It's no small feat that Robert Taylor left such a dynamic legacy at Tuskegee that now the Tuskegee School of Architecture is named after him. Max Bond, my beloved, died in 2009. And um, when I was at Columbia, he was the chair of architecture and planning. He became the dean of City University in New York. He was the first black man to serve on uh, the city planning commission. And I remember our cheering. It was just a major event. And um, when, Max, uh, when Max died, two years later, the City University of New York decided that they would name a portion of the uh, CUNY School of Architecture after him. So now we have the Max Bond Center for Urban Futures. Now, the other thing that I think is so important about this conversation, also my colleagues on the panel, is that in addition to being, let's just say it, total brainiacs for having been pushed through that curriculum, many of us told without promise, Max Bond was told that he had no talent when he entered Harvard University at the age of 15. He finished in three years and then went to the Harvard Graduate School of Design, carrying with him his Phi Beta Kappa key. So, so, so this is a very serious subject we have here. This is a serious subject about black architects who have held up the bloodstained banner and who are politically conscious enough to come back to community to serve. And that is something that everyone here on this panel is dedicated uh, to, and as we should be, because it is an honor to have even gotten the access to the education 
that we have gotten. Yeah. It should be noted also, if you want an architectural education in the state of Alabama, there are only two places. You'll either attend Auburn University or you will attend Tuskegee. Re realistically, both of them have limitations. And I remember a, a dear friend of mine uh, who's a doctor, where she took her boards, evidently there was a bumper crop of black doctors coming out of Fisk. And they did extremely well on the national boards, as did she, and she was finishing the uh, UAB. They refused to give her her license because there were too many black folk doing very well on the national exam. Somebody cheating. And after she got an attorney and went to him, all, all she said was, okay, I don't have time to play with you because I got student loans have to be paid. Let's do it again. So she rocked it one more time. You know? My point is, if architecture is what you want, there are only two places to get it. And the very least you can do is five years. Even if you get all of your liberal education courses out of the way, the architecture curriculum alone, studio, is five years. Um, you miss a semester, you miss a year. And I, I say that with grief because it took me eight. <laughs> so, so Vincent, you, you bring up a great point. Uh, and it, it helps us to understand uh, the importance of their work uh, and your work. But you also talk a little bit about uh, some of the stumbling blocks. Uh, Charles, I'd like to bring you in and talk a little bit about you know, what you see as some of the challenges, but more importantly, some of the opportunities ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I think a lot of the challenges have already been, been spoken on, so I, I won't be long on that at all. Uh, obviously, the challenges are still, you know, getting still inclusion, inclusion in, in the field, um, and not just for the sake of diversity, but uh, mm -hmm. as black people, as, as, you know, as, as any ethnicity or culture, you know, white, black, Hispanic, everybody brings something to the table. And I'm not saying all black people are the same either. I'm, I'm saying, you know, if you break that down, there are people who come from different backgrounds, uh, women, men, uh, they come from different backgrounds and they have different thought processes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you look over the, the medical field over the last several decades and, and, and they've not really solved any new issues. I mean, you think about the one thing, and this is gonna be weird, but you think about the one thing that was resolved over the past probably 50 years as the most famous thing is erectile dysfunction. Well, that affects predominantly older white males. And those are the guys who are pretty much running the medical field. So, so, you know, until, you know, if you look at, at heart disease, which affects uh, black women, if you look at, at any, anything else that affects any other ethnicity, until you start getting that equity and inclusion in those fields to make those decisions on where to put your research dollars and things like that, you'll always be fixing the same problems that only affect a small sector of the, of the, 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 the society. So architecture is no different, um, you know, we have to, we deal with different clients in, in, in certain manners, our mannerisms, our, you know, whatever you want to say. You have to bring something to the table besides just the design expertise and, and, and how do you interact with people, how do you deal with people. Uh, you know, us, we are very eager, we are very excited to get clients, we're, and, and we keep that. I've, I've seen other, other firms, maybe majority, majority firms, have the luxury to throw away uh, clients and you know and and for small things I'm not saying that you should work for peanuts but for very very small things oh we got so many we're just not even worry about those guys well you know if I'm somebody I want someone who's grateful not grateful but but appreciative to have me as a client um, and so if I don't feel that way if I'm just thrown out you know we've all 
going back to the civil rights thing, if you go into a store and you buy something and you're a certain color or a certain ethnicity or a certain whatever, they'll take your money, but they really didn't want you in the store. Well, it's, it's you know, that can also happen with clients and things like that. So uh, it's some give and take. So those are the, those are the, the, the things, but I do believe the opportunities uh, like panels like this, um, exposure to the field of architecture is 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 huge. Uh, if you know there, I, I go and and, and speak in, in Birmingham City Schools. Uh, I've spoken in some Jefferson County schools also uh, to uh, students uh, classes about what it is that we do as as architects. Um, you know, and it's not all. You know, yes, there are some 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 hard portions of it. But anything that's 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 worth a, a decent reward is worth the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So so if it was easy, everybody would would do it. Yeah, everybody um, could do it. But yeah. but so we <laughs> we 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 go and speak to, to students, uh, especially uh, uh, minority students, um, and and explain to them the, the joys that can come out of that. But there's also uh, you know it's not just architecture. It's it's you look at uh, every other field. There's there's not many ethnicities in, 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 in marketing, uh, which you talked about uh, marketing uh, when they got their marketing schemes together. You have to learn. Uh, finance, everything like that. So we have to expose our youth to as much as possible. Uh -huh. And not just that, but all right, now I've been exposed to it. How do I make that a reality? Um, yeah, you told me what an architect does. You told me what a doctor does. You told me what a lawyer does. but. My family has no money, no income, no, no nothing to get me over that hump. So how can we, you know, associate them with, with groups, with other sectors, with, with foundations that can get them to that level? Charles, it, since you mentioned that, internship, mm -hmm. we all suffered through it. Uh, <laughs> interns, architectural interns are some of the best educated workforce <laughs> that that work for cheap you that you're going to find. Yeah. Personally, I worked my way through it when it dawned on me that my architectural education put me right in line to be a real estate agent. Mm -hmm. So I went down and got my real estate license. And, and everybody was swearing how hard that exam was. And I'm looking at it. At the time, I was studying for my architectural license. <laughs> I'm saying, it's okay, <laughs> you know, we walk on through it. But that's what I had to do to feed my family. Because mm -hmm. you can't put that on hold. Can I just interject too, uh, between Victor and also Charles, you know, the, the one thing we also have not talked about is how expensive an architectural education is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> not, not, not four years, totally we're talking eight, about five years. years. And so, you know, it's a very expensive proposition yeah. that most people of color cannot afford. I'm, 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 I'm recalling how my education got paid for, and it's directly tied to the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, in 1968, the cities of America were burning because Martin Luther King had just been assassinated LA was burning, DC was burning, Detroit was burning, Chicago was burning, and the AIA invited Whitney Young, who was national director of the Urban League, as a keynote speaker to the American Institute of Architects Convention. And he got to the podium and looked at the all white male architectural membership audience, 99.9%. <laughs> <laughs> and ask them out loud, did they understand how totally irrelevant they were to the building and sustaining of community? Everyone gasped. At that time, Whitney Young also made a challenge to the white architectural community and said, you have got to diversify this field. So he made a challenge to AIA. The challenge was to diversify the field and set up scholarships for minority disadvantaged students so they could afford to come into school to learn how to rebuild their own communities. AIA joint venture with the Ford Foundation, and in 1970, they had the first class of 20 students that they had selected nationwide to go to architecture school, 
all expenses paid, I was one of that 20 people, wow. one of the first 20. What they didn't tell us once they gave us the scholarship, and we could take the scholarship to the school of our choice. I decided on Syracuse because I was following the quarterback of my high school football team. We <laughs> wanted to be the next Jim Brown. And Jim Brown had gone to Syracuse. That's the only reason. I got accepted. He did not, but never mind you that. Uh, AIA and Ford paid for my architectural education, mm -hmm. without which I couldn't have, I couldn't have done, I could not have done it. Yeah. And that affordability quotient makes you even more serious about study. Now, what AIA didn't tell me was that in order to keep their money, I had to have not, a, not an A average, not a C average, but I had to have a B average in architecture school in order to keep my money. So very few people saw me kind of playing and partying. I got my party on from time <laughs> to time. But I'm just saying, you know, it, it, it was a carrot and stick situation in terms of having to learn how to afford an education as expensive as architecture. Um, to, to something that Victor said I wanted to also talk about, and that is the importance of Tuskegee in this conversation mm -hmm. just across the board. It has touched so many lives, whether you went there to school or not. Uh, I was very interested to find out that Max Bond, one of the greatest architects of contemporary times, uh, got uh, excited about architecture because his father was a dean of academics at Tuskegee. And he went into the chapel and was just amazed at the architecture there. So it was at Tuskegee that Max Bond got excited about becoming an architect. Um, everyone we've talked about today has touched Tuskegee's campus in some way. And I also want to say that the present Dean of Architecture at the Robert Taylor School of Architecture and Construction Sciences is a black woman, mm -hmm. Dr. Carla J. Bell, mm -hmm. whose father at one time was the campus architect for Tuskegee. Wow. Wow. So there's this whole thing about legacy to discuss too. It's not lost to me that to my right I have Nolanda who is architect and attorney and her brother is head of urban design for the city of Birmingham. Then we have Charles Williams whose father, we call him Junior, his father <laughs> Senior is an architect. And then we got the Blackledge family over here where half of them are either architects or, or engineers. Yeah. So there is a legacy to discuss here that we should all be quite proud of. It's also not lost to me that Robert Taylor's great-granddaughter was Valerie Jarrett, mm -hmm. who served in the Obama administration mm -hmm. as, uh, as special advisor to the Obamas. So we have all of these legacies, all going back to Tuskegee, all going back to being black, all being, you know, going back to having the wherewithal to actually take on this gigantic mission and then come back to either educate, build, and serve. We and should I, be proud. I do want to piggyback on what Renee said about um, going, to, going to school and how uh, the AIA uh, kind of sponsored her scholarship. By the time I attended college, they have a standing scholarship now that's $500 for minority students. And I think you just have to be in good standing, but you can take that $500 and apply it to whatever the, education yeah. you want to that is affiliated with architecture. I'm not sure it's specifically still architecture now. And also, I want to encourage people, don't let not having access to funds stop, stop you from Thank realizing you. your dream. Mm -hmm. That was something I wanted to speak to because mm -hmm. the, the overriding thing of this panel of what we should get, there is no substitute for hunger. Mm -hmm. You gotta want it. Once your mind is made up, there, if you're committed to doing it, and I know one of my teary family sessions we were sitting there talking between me and my brothers and my sisters, and we could not understand, nor could we add up how Daddy put five of us through. Mm. At one time, he had three of us in Tuskegee. 
which was no small feat by itself. Never worked at a weapon in the steel plant. And that, that was just it. We had to, I don't think he know how much it cost to educate us. He just did it. All he did was tell us, what well, he told me personally, being the oldest son, I can get you one shot. You better be good at it. That's right. That's <laughs> I right. can get you one shot. Right. That I knew all the way going down the pipe. That as long as he said, I'm on your side, I can figure out how, one way or another. There are grants out there. There are part-time jobs. There are benevolent benefactors who will assist your education endeavors. But what you got to do is when you get there, you got to bring somebody with you. Go back and get one. If, if you can handle one, take one. If you can get five, take five. I'm here to tell you without a shadow of a doubt, it'll pay back. It'll Victor, pay, yes. we were inspired to do this series uh, because one of my colleagues, uh, Elijah Davis, uh, was actually doing a tour of the district. And he was giving a tour to some uh, middle school eighth graders. And uh, he was trying to expose them to the notion that uh, blacks had done a lot of great things here in Birmingham. And not one of them knew that uh, the 16th Street Baptist Church was designed and constructed by uh, blacks, that the Colored Masonic Temple was constructed and was designed and constructed by blacks. Uh, the first African-American bank in the state of Alabama, the Penny Savings Bank, was designed and constructed uh, by blacks. And so we've got this place where there's just this rich history, but nobody knows about it. Uh, I had a conversation after that with Renee, and uh, you got a chance to hear Renee today. And uh, I think the panelists uh, really understand who Renee is. And you know, the one thing she said, I mean, we gotta let people know about this stuff. And uh, that uh, inspired us to apply for this support from the Alabama Humanities Foundation. But I, I want to leave the audience with uh, one last thing from you guys uh, before we wrap up today. Uh, in terms of helping them understand uh, this dynamic footprint that we find ourselves in, the, the history of, of the gentleman that we talked about. Uh, but we brought it forward and talked about your work. Uh, in terms of uh, this footprint and uh, what we're attempting to do uh, in not only the Fourth Avenue District, but uh, in many communities across the country uh, to create this renaissance, uh, what kind of opportunities do you see for uh, black design professionals for uh, helping to make uh, places like this uh, an exciting place, uh, a place of importance, uh, and a uh, place of remembrance. And, and, and I say that uh, based on some of the comments that uh, you all have already made uh, with respects to, uh, especially Victor talked about it, uh, respects to uh, developing partnerships and opportunities to go forward. So I'll leave that for each one of you. If I could, I'd have to start with myself. I'm an architect by registration and education. My job with the city did not require a license. I went back and got that license because I had buku bucks in the education to get ready for it. And we just work. It's something about the, about being an architect that pushed me into it. But part of that job was being a civil servant. It also put me at the table when the decisions were made as to who we're going to give these commissions to 
who we're going to bring in. My counterparts down that knew it wasn't no shadow of a doubt. Yeah, we were going to hire somebody black for it, but they don't have no experience. They don't have the experience because you never hired them. It, it, it was stupid simple. You know? and, 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 and the, the pleasure of it was that I knew all they wanted was a shot, that they were good. I have, I've, I've worked with them, been there in, in, in the table across from them, and I've seen the other side. Yeah, we're good. We learned our lessons. We came up the rough side of the mountain. There, there is no doubt. Of, but what happened out of that was that I, you don't have to fight for it. All you got to do is mention it. They know what they've been doing. They're, they're, and when they come up to we want to joint venture, there were some holdouts. It was not joint venture. If I can't have a commission under my name that I get credit for, don't bother me. And that's the mindset that you have to go in. And if, if you've already paid for something, don't feel guilty about getting it. Just make sure you max out on the opportunity. And then advertise it. When I go to the community meetings and talk to the community, they know who did it. And for that matter, I, I want to, he's gone now, but I want to throw it in. David Jones, one of the best designers that I knew, period. And I watched the profession kill David if you don't mind my saying. Blood pressure went up, heart rate, diabetic. It, he was pure architecture. He lived, taught, ate it the whole nine, and didn't catch on to the business aspect of it fast enough to adjust for his physical body mm -hmm. to adjust to it. Charles, you're the youngest here, be aware. Your blood sugar has to be in control. <laughs> it will kill you, my friend. <laughs> Those things we have to, and, and for obvious reasons, I am mindful of it, because I intend to be here for a while. If you got an opportunity, Include another architect in on it by virtue of our educational qualifications. We are extremely capable of, if I could stand the sight of blood, I could have been a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the raw intelligence is there. And you can bring them on board. Any majority architectural firm will tell you. They have to become experts at whatever their largest commission is at the time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> on the firms that I did my internship with, when we were designing hospitals, I had to sit down and talk to a, a, an administrator to see how hospitals operate, how they work what federal requirements are, and we all have to do it. All that's germane with it, and if you're going and see a way to get there, attorney, they should all understand what a joint venture is, if that's the tool of choice. If that's how you have to be exposed to a certain area of architecture, if you got to be into a joint venture with somebody that's already there, do so. Renee? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say a few words about um, the importance of our being here, thank you for the invite, and the greater importance of our joining forces to preserve what's out there, because so much has been demolished. Mm -hmm. Birmingham is one of the few places I've lived 
a whole bunch of places, worked for a whole bunch of mayors. It's one of the few places that has been very late to the preservation movement. Um, as director of the Birmingham Civil Rights Trail Project, we have 200 signs, interpretive signs, out there in Birmingham. <coughs> Those slender, handsome, wonderful signs. I designed the system, and then Vicki Howell did the research and put all the historic text in. They now have QR codes on them, so they'll talk to you. But I tell you, for most people who come to this city, they know about the church because that's where the, where the bombing happened. A lot of the other things about Birmingham, they may not know. Those signs help with the interpretation of the history and will help us train a whole new generation of young people that know the history and that will lay down their lives to protect the history. Very interestingly enough, when it was time for me to put a sign out in front of the Gaston Funeral Home down the street, the Gaston Funeral Home had just been demolished. I had the sign, but the building had come down. What is up with that? We have got to protect this vanishing neighborhood. Now, how does one protect history when it comes to brick and mortar? Well, it's going to take, I hate to use the word, kahunas. OK? <laughs> and I mean that as a double entendre. You've got to have a political champion to save black community. And you've got to have access to cash, or as my grandkids say, you have to have access to that cheese in order to save community. And you've got to have a master plan. We're sitting in the middle of a National Monument Park, and all are eager to not only see the plan for the reconstruction of the actual buildings, such as the Gasson Motel, but my personal interest is, wow, I mean, how is that history going to be interpreted, and by whom? And by whom? I'm working on a project now in Africatown, and they found the last slave ship. And we still aren't clear as to who is going to tell what side of that story. Is that story going to be told by the descendants of the Clotilda? Or is that story going to be told by the people who run the tourism industry? Those are two different stories. If you do not make sure that the people who participate in the movement are engaged and involved. We have the foot soldiers right down the street on 4th Avenue. God bless them. Those were the people who were in the pictures getting bitten by the dogs, who were in the pictures getting washed down the street by the water hoses, Bull Connor's water hoses. And so my question is, as we rebuild this district, what are going to be the terms of engagement to make sure that the people who were actually the victims of the movement get to participate in the interpretation? I don't mean just a phone call, hey, tell, can you tell me one more time what happened? They need to be a part of that organizational structure that ensures that the depth of the story, or as black people say, the blood memory of the situation, also gets conveyed and also gets transferred. So we have work to do, and it's generational work, Absolutely. and it's ongoing work, because as we're sitting here now, who knows, there are buildings that could be coming down as we speak, because there is not correct me if I'm wrong, a preservation plan that's tied to an economic development plan, you know, for this district. Can I, pardon me, the, and I, I had thought about this before I got here, and they said I didn't want to do it, and I'm not even sure till yet whether it's a good idea, but the politics, mm -hmm. the politics of it, I saw what you see my direction to going at a solution. That is why I made sure that you know that I, up until retirement, I was the city historic preservation officer. God bless you. Nothing got demolished unless I signed off on it. The only way I would sign off on it, if it was politically entangled. <laughs> and, I, and I couldn't stop the demolition ball. 
other than what I could do in, in return, there was always requirements to document the existence of that structure before you will be permitted to, to take it down. But the heart and soul of the entire concept is something that I saw while I was employed as a civil servant, was to understand that I was a civil servant. Of all the projects I did, I was, I didn't feel comfortable even putting my name on it. <laughs> because that was a process that caused it to happen. Mm -hmm. What I have a problem with till yet, new administration, the first thing they do is lowball things that are important. By virtue of the way most things work, you never have enough money to do everything you want to do exactly when you want to do it. What we had was a process that caused us to lay out a master plan of what your end objective is and then break it down to an annual budget on a $12 million project. I can't get $12 million, but I can lay out phase one at 700,000. Then we got something to start with. But it does not work if you get caught in a political process where the person that actually appropriating the funds don't understand that this is just a standalone phase of a master plan. I stay up at night sometimes watching things that are obfuscating or just plain wiping out a plan that I know is already down there. And they play dumb largely because they are. Well, uh, I'm, to, I'm gonna piggyback on what Victor's saying and then I'm gonna, because these are the, these are the two who have worked in political office, so I'm going to speak a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to say they have worked a nine to five, which means that at five o'clock they get off and they don't have to worry about when the marketing. <laughs> well, the I mean, mean sixty-hour yeah. 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 60 weeks, yeah, but uh, they don't have to worry about marketing. Their their work is going to be there probably 120 hours if you chose to work that long. So it's because of their dedication and that they had something to do beyond that 40 hours because they probably are more mission driven um, in their careers, which is why the uh, City Hall got the 60 hours out of them instead of the 40. But from, <laughs> from uh, in, in private practice, I'm, uh, I'm often asked uh, what's my what's my favorite project? And my answer is always the next one because you kind of eat what you kill. I mean, if you have seen a project that at Studio 2H Design has done that's already come out of the ground, that means the money is spent, <laughs> that money is gone, and it's, we need something to replace it. So what I will say as one of the taxpayers who some of these commissions for the studies and all that in the selection process, I would just like it to be more equitable how um, government, how state government awards projects mm -hmm. and not just relegate um, minority participation or participation in what, no matter what minority, female, whatever, to whatever the 30% criteria is. Um, because I think there should be priorities for people who have offices in the city of Birmingham and, I and live in the city of Birmingham and I really don't give a distinction for black or white on that because we are the people who are paying the taxes to be able to fund some of these public works projects. But no matter the process works the same way. Yeah. The majority firms as they lobby council persons, mm -hmm. mayor assistants, mm -hmm. 
their lobbying efforts are stellar. We have got, as long as the system operates the way it does, we're going to have to acquire that skill. There is no doubt about it. Oh, I will tell you, me and Charles got skills. <laughs> Well, that, Charles and I exactly. both have skills. Sometimes now, it's just a, a is 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 access and it's preference. Now fast forward that. <laughs> when I first went in, the receptiveness for that was not there. Mm -hmm. The more I looked at it, and it was puzzling that I finally it finally dawned on me. We wasn't paying enough. I will share that. Uh, Ken Owens, Owens and Wood Partnership. Ken was the one that clued me in on it. About you not paying enough for professional services. Uh -huh. Well, a city of Birmingham. Not, not paying for professional services because we pay top dollar. Mm -hmm. The city yeah. paid top dollar in I terms of fees and commission mm -hmm. for professional services. The politicians sitting at the table we're not being paid enough to pay attention mm. to what we were saying. Mm. So, something radical had to happen for them to say, oh, he told me that. Mm. And a lot of times, it's when funds come down the pipe. Mm. Federal funds that make some projects look better to do than others. And they would just take out after, the politicians would take out after the project, not having a clue what the end products should look like or should be. And we tried to change that, but it has still not been perfected. One of the better things that the city of Birmingham has is the citizen participation program. I've seen that program hijacked sometimes and just playing low ball at others. But we've got to, one of my personal sayings when people will ask me, who do I work for? I got the hardest job on the block. Mm -hmm. Got about 400,000 clients. <laughs> well, I will say for Studio 2H Design, the city of Birmingham has been a great partner for us and a long-term partner. Um, and um, I would, of course, like to do more projects. But of course, I know that they spread the wealth around. And that's where it's incumbent on firms like Charles and I when there are projects that make sense for us to team that we do. And I'm going to let him kind of piggyback on that because we've, we've done some of that on some projects. Yeah, just in case anybody from the current administration is watching, uh, we love our partnership with the city <laughs> at Charles Williams and Associates. So um, uh, Mayor Woodfin, all you guys down there, um, all the derision that may have been cast was not by us, but, and, it, and it's not been on this current administration. So, we, you know, but um, like Nolanda was saying, we, we I think the biggest thing for us to do is uh, we partner with, with on, on, on several projects. We partner mm -hmm. with uh, majority firms, we partner with other minority firms. Um, for us, you know, there are a lot of ways that you can go about looking at projects. UAB has something now. Uh, they'll put out large projects. Well, we know that us alone, our firm alone can't go after those projects. So, and, and a lot of those projects are so specific in nature that really nobody in the state of Alabama has the expertise. So now you bring in national firms, but they've already set it up that there needs to be a strong local participation on the mm -hmm. team. So that allows us to even the, the, the playing field a little bit by going out and getting the national firms that can't necessarily come in and do it on their own. City of Birmingham, we partnered on, uh, on the, the, the stadium and the arena projects uh, to go after that. So partnering does a lot of things. Um, mm -hmm. it, so it, there's you know, the largest firms in the world, not just architecture, but the lar largest concerns in the world partner. So, you know, if they need, if they have to do it to be successful, uh, far be it for us to say that we can't do it, so. That's part of the marketing aspect of it. And I mean, one firm, Jennifer Harris, and we came in one Monday only to find out that 
Al had been gone all week. We were looking for him to work on the specs for that week to get them written. He had to leave to go to Gulf, Gulf Shores because the client at Shelby Memorial Hospital had promised his kids that he was going to take them down to the condo on the beach. Well, he couldn't take his kids down there, but he had an architect that could. And Al had to stop whatever he was doing to make sure that that client was totally comfortable with him. Now, me and my black self, I'd never do something like that. Oh, no, it ain't good. But live and learn. If that's a valued relationship, if that's an ongoing commission, yeah. If I can't make it, I get my cousin to drive them down <laughs> to the coast. That there are, there's an art to marketing that I'm still convinced we haven't mastered yet because I've lived long enough to see it done in a number of ways. And the first thing that that process shook off was color. It boiled down to relationships, relationships, relationships. Ladies and gentlemen, didn't you have a great time uh, listening to this panel? Uh, to I'd like to thank my wonderful, wonderful guests, uh, Mr. Victor Blackledge, Ms. Renee Kemp Rattan, Ms. Nolanda Hatcher, and Mr. Charles Williams II. We had a great time talking to you tonight. Nobody knows my name. We hope that you will come downtown, uh, do a scavenger hunt, try to figure out a little bit about your history, a little bit about the district, uh, but more importantly, a little bit more about opportunity. Uh, this panel talked a little bit about history, but they also gave us some insight into opportunity. So we thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that you had a great, great evening. Thank you. Wow, thank you again. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holloway, for moderating this uh, great panel. Uh, such great, robust information. Uh, I think Renee Kemp Rotan said once, if the buildings could talk on 4th Avenue, the stories they could tell, I think the buildings are talking now. Uh, I want to uh, invite you at any given time to, to come to the historic 4th Avenue Business District. Uh, there are tours of the different buildings that exist. Uh, I want to also thank not only our panelists, I want to thank the Alabama Humanities Foundation for their funding and support. Uh, and stay tuned, this is the winter series of Nobody uh, uh, Knows My Name. We're looking to launch a spring series soon. So thank you, and thanks to ICU Media, who did a great job on the production of this uh, program. Thank you. <laughs>